somebody recently hacked into my Facebook account and sent out a message to all the people who were in my uh, Facebook contacts list that said, well, two messages. One was, go and watch this cute YouTube video of a gorilla smoking a cigarette, isn't it funny, ha ha. And the second was, go to this website and you'll find why, who, and how you can uh, get with a gorgeous woman, man, person, whatever, in a sexual sense. I didn't know about this. Eventually, people who were in my Facebook contact list, who knew me well, wrote to me and said, this doesn't really sound like you. And what they were referring to was not so much being directed to those sites, but rather the actual prose style that was used in the messages. It's just not the way that I happen to write. And I realized, good grief, there are like 50, 60 people out there minimum who are suddenly saying, what kind of a sleaze bag is he? And then I got somebody writing to me saying, one of my undergrads who've been reading your work in our class showed me this site. What are you doing? Have you lost your mind? And I did get very worried. I changed my password. I sent a note out to everybody on my address book, apologizing, saying that I hadn't recommended these sites and so on. Now, I knew when I entered Facebook, there would be certain amounts of my privacy that would be put on public view. What I didn't think was that I would actually lose the authorial control over the way that I was being presented. Because the great claim of social networking sites is that you can represent yourself to yourself and to the world and to people like you. But what about if, in fact, that notion of I'm representing myself is thoroughly mediated by others, not just through hacking, that's an obvious example I've just given, but just as much through instances where, for example, you decide to use a particular software tool, maybe one that allows you to say all the cities you've visited in the world or in your province, and that social networking tool is actually funded by a corporation that uses that knowledge of your personal history to sell things about you to other companies that might want to market things to you, you might say, I'm not bothered, I don't care. How about if I say to you, excuse me, your life history should be your intellectual property. You should be in a position where you can make money out of that if you want to. The same thing would apply to somebody who is, being, uh, who is a participant in a virtual world or an online game. If, for example, you sign on to play these games and you participate in discussion boards, FAQ groups, alternative software groups, and so forth, almost certainly, if your game is owned by a big multinational, you will have to have signed a, an agreement that says all the intellectual property, i.e. ideas, insights, innovations, stories that you come up with are no longer owned by you. But the minute they're shared in a social networking sense with others, not by playing the game alone, but simply by virtue of participating in these discussion groups, those ideas, those innovations, those stories are owned by the corporate owner of the game itself. So your talent is being handed out not for free to those companies because you're actually paying them for the privilege when you meet your monthly capitation fee. That's what a, uh, a EULA or end user licensing agreement basically produces. So in many of these worlds, there are real costs to you as your life is commodified by others without your agreement, without your say so, and without your getting any money. So for those who say, oh, I put my life up on Facebook, that's my choice, I have nothing to worry about, Think about, if nothing else, the way in which participation in this way is making money for others without your agreement.